Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the third in this series of webinars on the investment implications of COVID-19. Uh, I hope that you are all well, uh, that you managed to get some uh, of a break over Easter and that you're managing to survive uh, this period of, of isolation. If you've got kids at home, I hope you're surviving um, either the school holidays if you're in New South Wales or the homeschooling for those whose kids, kids have gone back to school already. Um, so today we do uh, have a, a great agenda for you, I think. Um, we're gonna hear from Guion Moore, our Head of Investment Strategy with uh, a bit of a macro update and market update. And then we're gonna take a bit of a dive into real assets and how they're responding to this uh, crisis period. Um, and to cover that, we've got our resident real asset experts. Uh, firstly, Patty Brown, our head of real estate, the Pacific is gonna take us through um, some general comments on real assets and then look specifically in at the uh, unlisted property markets. And then we're gonna hear from Mark Murray, our portfolio manager on unlisted infrastructure, uh, just to have a look at some of the specifics around the infrastructure uh, assets and markets. Um, so there is an ability to have uh, Q&A at the end, so you can submit your questions at any time. Please use the Q&A button that you have within your Zoom window to submit these questions. Uh, we will hold questions and pick them all up um, at the end, but you can pop them in there as we go through and as you think of them. Um, and just before I hand over to Guion, just a, a quick shout out and heads up uh, for next week's webinar, which will be at the same time, 2, 2 p.m. on Thursday afternoon. Um, another great agenda for that one. So again, we'll have uh, a macro update by our market strategist, Yaying Dong, um, but we're also gonna have uh, Dr. Harry Lim, our capital markets expert. And Harry's gonna talk to us a little bit about what the longer term capital market assumption implications uh, might be from this crisis period. And we're also going to be joined by Helga Bergden, our Global Head of Responsible Investment. And Helga's going to look at some of the linkages, if you like, between uh, ESG factors and responsible investing uh, and, and the, um, the coronavirus. So I think that's going to be a really great session and hope that you can join us next week as well. So with that, um, I will hand over to Guion for the macro update. Thanks, Guion. Hey there, thank you Kylie, um, uh, and thank you to everyone who's joined us on the call. Um, I hope you're as well as can be in these difficult times. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is a high-level survey of the state of the pandemic and financial markets with a bit of a focus on oil and equity valuations. Um, so it's been a week since our last webinar uh, and a fortnight since I last spoke. In that fortnight, the, um, the number of confirmed cases of COVID-19 has doubled from 1 million to 2 million, and the S&P has rallied 10%. Two events at the first glance would seem at odds with each other, uh, and in some ways it's actually more stark than that. Since the low of the S&P uh, of 2200 on the 25th of March, uh, the index has rallied 25%. Uh, meanwhile, the pandemic, pandemic has increased fourfold. Uh, um, naturally, markets look forward to um, anticipate future events, and there is, there is some cause for hope, or at least to reduce pessimism. Um, the graph on the left from the FT um, shows the number of uh, daily new cases of COVID-19 for various countries. Uh, the pace of growth of the pandemic is slowing, with the number of new confirmed cases falling in most European nations and plateauing in the US, albeit at painfully high levels. Uh, while in Australia and New Zealand, we're heading hopefully to an end of local transmission of the virus, at least for the time being. Um, naturally, as the pandemic starts to slow, our thoughts turn to what next? Uh, can we look forward to a return to normal? Um, both Austria and Norway have taken small steps towards relaxing their social distancing measures. Or maybe this is a false dawn with a prospect of a resurgence in the pandemic. Uh, more deaths and more renewed economic damage. We've seen Singapore uh, step up its social distancing regime and the, um, the state of the pandemic in Japan, which uh, was looking well contained, may, uh, may be re-accelerating. And we're all aware of the trajectory taken by the Spanish flu 100 years ago, three waves of, of infection. 
The pandemic is slowing, but the dangers are still very much there, and there's huge uncertainty and debate about the right path and speed to normalisation. Currently, markets are taking a very optimistic outlook. Supported by extraordinary policy measures, markets are perhaps pricing in a scenario with a final number of confirmed infections in the millions rather than the tens or hundreds of millions, let alone the 30 to 70 percent of all humanity forecast by some, some epidemiologists. Um, the optimism can be seen in the charts on the right. Uh, the S&P 500 has retraced half its decline from the peak, while the VIX is heading rapidly back towards more normal levels. Um, if we could skip on to the next slide. Uh, next slide, thank you. Uh, indeed, the, the, the market recovery is fairly broad based. Um, the graph on the top left shows credit spreads, um, uh, uh, investment grade and high yield in the US. Um, spreads are coming down very quickly indeed, um, supported in part by the Fed backstop for corporate bonds and the, um, and the optimism about the trajectory of the pandemic. On the top right, we have US interest rates and break even inflation. Um, while interest rates haven't risen, break even inflation has risen sharply. Just counting some of the more deflationary scenarios um, that, were, uh, that we were looking at two weeks ago. Similarly, both the Australian dollar and New Zealand dollar have rallied back from the lows that were achieved during the US dollar liquidity squeeze. Indeed, the only major market factor that isn't participating in the rally, apart from interest rates, is oil, where the price per barrel has fallen as low as $20 per barrel. Uh, could we step onto the next slide? Um, and so the, um, the, the, the collapse in March of OPEC and the fall in the price of oil precipitated the second fast leg down in, in financial markets. Um, in the previous webinar, webinar, I referred to this being a, a black signet. Of course, signets are in fact grey, um, but the idea is still valid. Um, OPEC collapsed due to the failure of Russia and Saudi Arabia to agree on how to share the required production cuts to compensate for the reduction in demand for oil resulting from the Chinese slowdown. Uh, since then, um, with the shutdown spreading to the US and Europe, uh, the impact on the oil demand has only got worse. Uh, the graph on the top left shows the magnitude of the challenge. The chart shows petroleum consumption in millions of, uh, of barrels of oil per day in the US, as measured by the Department of Energy. Um, there's been roughly a one third reduction um, since the beginning of April, taking consumption levels back to those not seen since the uh, 1990s. Globally, the situation is even worse. The graph on the top right shows the demand supply mismatch globally in millions of barrels of oils per day. There is roughly a fifth equivalent to about 15% of normal demand. Um, earlier this week, uh, OPEC reconvened um, and uh, announced a target reduction in 10 million uh, barrels of oil a day starting in May. Um, which, assuming all the OPEC members um, and OPEC Plus play along, is still not enough to, um, to plug the current gap between supply and demand. So it's likely that the price of oil should remain under pressure for a while yet. Um, in normal economic environment, the reduction in the price of oil would amount to something similar to a tax cut for consumers worldwide. Um, this was certainly the outcome during the 2015 collapse in the price of oil. Uh, this time it's more challenging uh, since many consumers are simply not spending the money or engaging in the required economic activity to really realise those savings. Um, so in this case, I think the big winner will be China, which will benefit the most from the cost savings as its economy returns to normal. Uh, indeed, if the price of the oil were to remain at $20 a barrel for a year compared to the pre-crisis $60 a barrel, this would amount to a $200 billion saving for the Chinese, US dollar saving for the Chinese economy. There are losers, of course. Um, US shale producers being hit very hard. And the graph at the bottom of the slide um, shows the divergence between high yield spreads for the energy sector and for the rest of the high yield complex. Um, like 2015, there's been a pronounced divergence reflecting the energy sector, that the energy sector is particularly stressed at the moment. And this is a kind of a microcosm of the very wide sectorial divergences in how the crisis impacts different companies. Something that's become um, more starkly apparent as we move through the US earnings season. Um, could we slip on to the next slide? Um, naturally, with um, such a pronounced rally in equity uh, and the US earnings season beginning, 
The prime question we face in our portfolios is what does the uncertain future hold for equities? Um, the graph to the top right shows year-on-year -year changes in global GDP growth and analysts' forward expectations for corporate earnings. There is usually a fairly strong relation GDP growth levered up by the corporate capital structure. Um, taking a look at the graph and using plausible estimates of the hit to global GDP, something that's GFC-like, it's not unreasonable to think that forward PEs could fall as much as 30% from their peak, even in a favourable scenario. Um, and some of that decline has already started. If you look at the chart on the top right, this shows 12-month forward and 12-month trailing earnings for the S&P. You can see the blue line, the forward earnings expectations have already started to fall as analysts update their projections, although there's arguably still some way to go. Um, one of the counterintuitive outcomes of the market rally combined with the falling earnings expectations is the valuation of equity markets has returned to their pre-pandemic highs. Uh, the graph at the bottom shows 12-month forward P ratios for the S&P 500. Uh, the combined impact of the rising P and the falling E has pushed P ratios back up to 20, the highest since the dot-com bubble. Um, indeed, if we were to um, assume that forward earnings will fall as much as 30% from their highs, um, if, equity market, if equity prices were to stay where they are now, we would see forward PEs in the region of 24, um, similar valuations to those seen at the height of the dot-com bubble. Uh, the high level of valuations create a headwind for further increase in equity prices and places valuations at risk if the pandemic does not reach the optimi optimistic outcome currently anticipated. Uh, so for the time being, at least, we remain cautious and a little sceptical of the sustainability of of a rally over the shorter term horizon. Um, I'm going to leave off now. Um, hopefully there'll be questions at the end. I'll hand over to Paddy Brown, um, our head of real estate, who'll be discussing the, um, the impact of the, uh, of the pandemic on, the, on the real estate assets. Thanks, Leon. The COVID-19 pandemic struck as real assets were performing strongly. New supply and demand levels were in check with institutional investors having learned their lessons from the GFC and remaining focused on the asset class's stable income generation and uncorrelated returns. Over the past few months, governments enforcing social distancing have increasingly restricted physical access to real assets. We've seen shopping malls temporarily close. Employees work from home. Aviation and road travel slow to a trickle. So what does all this all mean for real assets? The primary impact we need to consider is the loss of income during the slowdown. In Australia and New Zealand, we expect this period to be significantly shorter than in other markets globally. Income for many assets is contractual and not directly related to asset usage. And we're seeing income flow from most assets despite the shutdown, with forecome income losses representing a small fraction of the total asset valuation. However, the secondary impacts are more concerning. How long will the current recession endure and how will this affect long-term cash flows? Will prolonged shutdowns lead to a change in consumer behaviour, speeding up adoption of online shopping, working from home and less frequent travel? Will investors now see real assets as a higher risk and demand a higher premium? As we know, unlisted asset valuations lag listed markets, often by some margin. In Australia, most super funds have adjusted down the value of their real assets by 3 to 10% to reflect the disruption these assets are currently enduring and the likely challenges ahead. I'll now focus on uh, some lessons for real estate. On the next slide, please. For real estate specifically, the impacts vary significantly by sector and by geography. The shutdown has had an immediate impact on income for hotels, hospitality venues, education facilities and shopping malls, particularly those focused on discretionary spending. Unfortunately, some tenants in these sectors were struggling before the pandemic and we expect these sectors to take a considerable time to recover. Office buildings have seen a far less impact, especially those leased long-term to tenants with strong balance sheets. Office vacancy was very low in most Australian and New Zealand cities prior to the pandemic, which provides landlords with robust cash flows. Logistics 
and supermarkets have been relative beneficiaries of the pandemic, with tenants seeing significantly increased demand. Supermarket sales in our portfolios are up by over 20% on last year's levels. As you can see on the chart on the right, sell-up in listed REITs mirrors the decline for income in these sectors. Listed markets were trading at premiums to underlying valuations prior to the crisis. And this data was from the 31st of March. So as Guion says, we've seen significant recoveries further since this data was produced. Investors should monitor their debt covenants closely, with interest covered ratios expected to come under pressure for affected landlords should the shutdown last for many months. And in Australia, the government has legislated a code of conduct for smaller tenants seeking rent relief. State governments are also providing land tax relief to landlords. So the government is coming to the party uh, for commercial landlords and tenants, but to a lesser extent than they have done for the for the banks. On the next slide, we'll look at some opportunities uh, that we're seeing in the sectors at the moment. So, as with every kind of major downturn. Uh, a downturn throws up great opportunities for long-term investors, particularly those who have liquidity to participate. Um, as we know from, from previous downturns, quality assets significantly outperform in a recessionary scenario, and quite often these quality assets are only available to purchase in a downturn. Investors looking to uh, participate um, and put, set their portfolios to benefit from the downturn should really focus on assets with long leases which have structured rental growth which will get you through um, the period of uncertainty and the uh, current recession. The assets which focus on uh, sustainability are becoming increasingly far more attractive to tenants and their own uh, employees. So you're very focused on assets which have those sustainability credentials. Sustainable assets also have far lower running costs and operating costs than the average asset. Assets which, which, they, which have these kind of characteristics, which are well located, uh, well maintained, good sustainability credentials, generally have low vacancy, which again provides you with that income cushion um, through periods of poor economic growth. And again, once we go through the, uh, the current, current pandemic and the, the current shutdowns, investors will increasingly be focused on the attractive income yield of property as they were a couple of months ago prior to the pandemic. So in a very low income, interest world, um, debt is going to be very, very cheap for, for high quality assets. Uh, income yields from commercial property are going to be very attractive and very attractive to those debt levels. So we again expect investors to be focused on those attractive income yields. What should you target in this current um, downturn? Uh, we are going to expect to see some significant discount, significantly discounted secondaries come into market. We can see that some of the Australian super funds uh, are overweight to unlisted assets. Um, they will have uh, to trim their portfolios at some stage, and we would expect some discounted secondaries to come through. In fact, with our own portfolios, we've been taking advantage of some secondaries already, uh, which have come through at, at significantly lower valuations or significantly higher discounts than we've seen in the past um, eight to 10 years. Sale trans and leaseback transactions will also be prevalent. Uh, governments and corporate balance sheets are gonna be stretched, and some of these high quality assets, again, will come to, come to market only once in a cycle. Investors should really focus on long-term thematics at this period. So while um, hotels, tourism-related assets, education-related assets are really struggling from an income perspective at the moment, those investors who've got the long-term uh, balance sheets to, to withstand the short-term volatility can play into those thematics. Likewise with, uh, with aging populations and the significant need as we're currently seeing for medical facilities, uh, these thematics are, are long-term and will, will exist. Um, yeah close the end of the, the pandemic. Both Australia and New Zealand also uh, have a significant need for ongoing immigration, um, which is on hold at the moment. But again, if you can position yourself for that growing population and in cities where those populations are growing over time, uh, we think investors will do, do very well. And finally, I think inflation sensitivity is something that uh, you know, it's not been considered uh, for the last few years, but you know, with the amount of stimulus going into the, um, the economies from governments, uh, inflation will come back at some stage and acquiring assets with those with inflation sensitivity is probably a sensible idea at this stage of the cycle. I'll hand on over to Mark Murray now to uh, speak about infrastructure. Thanks, Paddy. Good afternoon to everyone on the call. Some infrastructure assets have been hit very hard by current circumstances. 
while some have been affected much less so. I'll talk about short-term and longer-term implications for different assets. I'll also cover more direct implications for investors, including capital calls, valuations, and opportunities. Transport assets are currently being affected the most. Airports have lost 90% or more of their flight and passenger volumes because of domestic and international travel restrictions. Meanwhile, toll roads have experienced sharp traffic declines, mainly because of less light vehicle traffic at this stage, as people have begun social distancing, working from home, or have lost their jobs. In that regard, Transurban has reported traffic, traffic drop of close to half in early April versus the prior comparable period. Seaports have been less affected, but sharp drops in production as well as consumption are resulting in lower trade volumes. Rail freight may be similarly affected due to less economic activity. Other major infrastructure asset types are regulated energy utilities and contracted power generating assets. These assets are less affected financially, although operationally their jobs are likely to be more complicated because of social distancing. Regulated utilities commonly will be permitted to recover any under earnings in the current regulatory period through charging higher prices in the next period. At the same time, it's possible that authorities will ask companies to provide levels of build relief to their customers with the ability to cover these, recover these amounts, but perhaps needing to be confirmed specifically. Power generating assets that are not fully contracted at fixed rates may be negatively affected by lower spot market prices as a result of less power demand across the economy. Other types of infrastructure are likely to be less affected financially. Social infrastructure assets like hospitals and schools are typically funded by private investors in return for availability payments. Investors should be prote protected provided this revenue structure applies although any difficulties in maintaining the facilities will need to be addressed to avoid revenue abatements. Communications assets such as broadcast towers and data centres are becoming more important for all of us in our daily activities. These assets will benefit if operators need to book more capacity due to more data and call volumes while we are social distancing. And moving on there, there might be some long lasting effects on infrastructure assets for investors to consider. These could include higher reliance on personal transport versus public transport. At the same time, more people may choose to work remotely after having had some practice at it, which could reduce the overall number of data commuters. A recovery in airport traffic may be slowed if border restrictions take time to be lifted and travel warnings by authorities continue. This might be because some countries take more time to overcome COVID-19 an international agreement about new practices proves to be difficult. A permanent reduction in the number of airlines, particularly domestically, would be a negative factor for airports. Meanwhile, less activity through seaports is likely while weaker economic conditions prevail. In places around the world that are enjoying much improved air quality right now, there might be less tolerance for high pollution levels in future. This might lead to more financial support for renewable energy or other ways of reducing air pollution which could create investment opportunities. More generally, there may be more costs associated with infrastructure assets during construction and then operation. For example, supply chains are being disrupted now and may take time to recover. Some new public health practices may become permanent features and have to be accommodated. These will all need to be identified and built into financial protections. Inevitably, there will be many variations in impact globally, both as a result of economies being differently affected and different responses from authorities. Now, if we turn to the next slide, there are other issues for investors to focus upon as well. Asset level debt covenant headroom may be reducing now because of revenue declines, liquidity facilities and business continuity plans are being called upon. New debt financing is more costly than it was at the start of 2020. So it might be better to defer this where possible. Some assets may need new equity support. This would either result in capital calls being sent to existing investors or new equity being raised, possibly at a discount to the current equity valuation. Most ex exit activity is likely to be on hold because, of, because IPOs are a less credible option at the current time and investors are likely to want to commit less new capital in the short term. This also has implications for new fundraising activity. This month, frequent reports that most LPs surveyed planned to lower their 2020 commitment plans. At the same time, managers have access to substantial undrawn capital already committed by investors, and they will be surveying the market with interest now. 
Frequent reported capital totaling 583 billion US dollars was available for infrastructure fund investment as of June 2019. There may be an uptick in secondary market, secondary fund market activity if investors want to divest holdings due to the economic outlook or other reasons. Unlisted asset valuation impacts reported by managers may be limited in the short term for reasons including time needed to properly identify impacts and a shortage of comparable transactions having occurred in current circumstances. And I'll finish by saying this is a time when listed infrastructure may present an opportunity in valuation terms, but the period ahead is likely to present some attractive opportunities in the unlisted space to participate in larger controlling stakes in good assets for the long term. And with that, I'll hand back to Kylie. Thanks, uh, gentlemen. I think there were some really tremendous uh, insights there. So we will go to the Q&A. So just a reminder, um, if you do want to submit a question, uh, if you can go to the, the Q&A uh, button and you can type your question in there. Um, Patty, it looks like the first couple are around property. Um, so I'm, I'll just stick with you for these first couple. Um, one is around super fund liquidity, which has been hit by the early access to super rebalancing needs members switching. Um, do you think this will cause permanent changes to the level of unlisted assets um, or real estate specifically um, that funds will be able to hold in the future? Probably, uh, probably a question for, uh, for a CIO, Kylie. But uh, I think um, yeah, it, it's really going to depend on the, the allocations that the funds have uh, yeah, on the, the types of members. I think the, um, the early access to super was really um, out, of, out of left field for, for many funds. Um, you know, that, was, that was something that was not modelled uh, by a lot of, lot of funds. And you know, potentially they had too high allocations to, to liquid assets. Uh, but you know, I, think, I think on the whole, um, most funds are pretty comfortable with their liquidity position. Their ability to, to fund this early access to super, uh, their ability to deal with, with member switching. Um, you know, we've seen that uh, most of the large funds move very quickly to preserve member equity by uh, making adjustments to their unlisted assets. Uh, so, you know, I think I think on the whole, uh, most funds are pretty comfortable with their with their allocations. But you know, at the margin, some funds may have uh, um, allocated a little bit too highly and, uh, and be that comfortable with that. But I, I wouldn't expect to see a significant. Um, decrease in, in allocations at an industry level to unlisted assets. Yeah, and I think I'd concur with those um, comments. I think these periods um, you know, are a test of the liquidity stress testing that most funds should be doing just to make sure that they've got that calibrated um, correctly because it is an important input into determining your appetite for illiquid assets. And so if you've done that well, um, I would think this current situation shouldn't be causing funds to really think, rethink those allocations that they have. I think where you might see some changes perhaps is, is, is maybe where that analysis hasn't been particularly um, insightful for a period such as this. But, but most funds should be undertaking liquidity stress testing that considers uh, material changes in liquidity requirements at the same time when you get uh, a material change in market valuations. And um, as you said, Patty, I think m most funds are pretty well positioned to be able to hold their assets through this period and meet those liquidity requirements. Uh, I'm sure there will be some funds who, who uh, are, are particularly tested though. Um, so I'll just stick with you, Patty, with the next question. It's a little bit more specific. Um, so. Um, from our New Zealand um, audience. There's a question specifically around Bayfair uh, Tauranga. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, how is it yeah. fared? Yeah, Tauranga. How is it fared under the, the lockdown? Uh, there are stories about retail operations uh, refusing to pay rent. Um, are there any managers in their support portfolio under pressure from their debt covenants? Yeah, no, thanks for that, that question. Uh, so I think. Yeah, both there is uh, for, for those uh, not familiar with the asset and uh, our Australian uh, colleagues and uh, clients. Um, it, it's, a, it's a larger, more discretionary style asset, so you know, similar to to a Westfield uh, in Australia. Uh, most of the income you know, from from Bayfair and uh, those Westfield assets comes uh, from what we call discretionary tenants. So they tend to be uh, fashion retailers, um, food and food and beverage type um, retailers. It's more of a destination shop and this is exactly uh, the, the kind of centre which is really really struggling um, in the shutdown period. 
in New Zealand, uh, the, the government has mandated um, a lockdown for four weeks. So all um, real estate has been treated equally. Everything's been, been shut down. And um, retailers have not been trading uh, apart from essential supermarkets. So based there, um, as, as most large malls, has a supermarket which is trading extremely well and th that is paying uh, about 20% of the, the total rent uh, in the centre. Um, retailers for the balance of the, uh, the centre are contractually bound to, to pay rent. Uh, in Australia, uh, the government has legislated SME um, uh, code of conduct which uh, allows SMEs to defer uh, and in some circumstances have an abatement of their rent for the period of the shutdown in proportion with the, the slowdown in their business. We haven't seen that kind of legislation in New Zealand. So tenants are, are still legally bound to, to pay the rent uh, as, of, as of today. Um, however, landlords are working you know, with good tenants and tenants that they want to still exist uh, post the end of the, the lockdown period. So yes, there, there will be a, uh, an abatement period um, for, for some of those tenants. Um, it's very much on a case by case basis. Uh, quite often, the, uh, that rent will either be paid back uh, post the, the end of the, the lockdown or the, or the shutdown, or leases will be extended for a uh, commensurate period. So it's generally not being treated as a, as a write-off of income, albeit landlords are helping tenants with cash flows through that period. Um, and, and that's um, ac across the industry. So clearly, um, markets where the lockdowns and shutdowns are lasting a lot longer. So in the US and parts of Europe, uh, retailers are far more challenged. I um, saw some results from Unibuy in the UK, also uh, in Europe recently. Uh, they're only collecting about 25% of their, their rent um, for, the, for the quarter. So you know, that's, that's going to have some serious issues for their, their ICR, um, their interest cover ratios, which is the second part of, the, of that question. We're not seeing any of those issues in the portfolio uh, that we're managing in, in Australia and New Zealand yet. And I would note that the uh, reporting of the ICR to banks uh, happens quarterly in arrears. So by the time, if any assets were actually uh, tripping those technical ICR um, covenants, by the time they actually came around to reporting to the banks, would be likely out of lockdown and, and shutdowns anyway. So it's going to be likely a technical breach as opposed to a, a long-term breach. Um, different, difficult, different situation for private equity firms which have less diversified portfolios and much higher levels of gearing. But you know, we, we don't invest uh, with those vehicles uh, in, in, in the Australian and uh, New Zealand funds. Okay, thanks, Paddy. Um, Mark, I might come to you. I mean, this is, there's a couple of general questions here around, um, you know, the ability to effectively value the unlisted assets or the real assets through this period. So really questions around, you know, what will be the main inputs or considerations into the 31 March revaluations that that are done um, and then sort of, you know, what the expected changes might be as we head into the next few valuation cycles and then a sort of a broader question around you know will Mercer or indeed I guess it could be any anyone who owns unlisted assets be adopting you know any changes to valuation approaches including the frequency um, under which the the assets get revalued so Mark do you want to have a first go about that sort of question more generally around valuing unlisted assets through this period yeah, thanks, Kylie. Um, so uh, the the current environment presents some obvious challenges in valuing assets uh, that uh, that weren't prevalent uh, you know, a quarter ago. Um, so on the one hand, uh, projecting uh, net income is uh, is more uncertain now because of um, because of you know, drops in revenue and the prospective drops in revenue that might occur through an economic downturn. Uh, depending on how long uh, it's sustained for. Uh, at the same time as there's a, a potential drop in revenue uh, that might be offset to some extent by, uh, um, by cost savings, uh, there's also the potential for higher, higher interest costs uh, if and when uh, uh, refinancing needs to be undertaken at, uh, at elevated credit spreads. Um, so that's that. Those uh, you know, net income flows are, are negative for valuations. Uh, another negative for valuations is the potential discount rates that are going to be adopted. Um, uh, discount rates that might include higher risk premium because of the because of the the, the more uncertain outlook. So both of those are 
uh, cause to think that uh, the valuations of unlisted assets will be lower. Uh, and, and across the industry, uh, we've seen superannuation funds uh, lowering the, uh, the valuations of their unlisted assets because of these factors. Um, uh, and uh, while, it's, while it's perhaps the case that uh, you know, asset managers uh, appointed by those super funds might take a little time to, to uh, assess the outlook and um, identify comparable transactions that are, are useful data points for their, for that, for their valuation purposes, uh, at super funds and, and investors uh, like them have, 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 we think, proactively sought to reduce uh, their valuations in anticipation of, uh, of and a uh, reflection of their uh, assessment of the outlook. Okay, thanks, Mark. Um, Guion, just so that you don't feel too left out, um, and I know it shows how topical the real assets question is because I know Guion, you, you normally get most of the questions, but um, just to, to touch on maybe going back to a topic that we talked about a couple of weeks ago, which was looking at the opportunities that might be opening up within the credit markets given where spreads have moved. Um, so this is just really looking to get, I guess, an updated view taking into consideration some of the market moves that have happened um, over the last couple of weeks and whether we still see opportunity there. Oh, yes, absolutely. Thank you very much, Carly. Uh, um, so one of, one of the core recommendations coming out of our DAA process was a, um, a preference for, uh, for credit spread within the portfolio. And that represented as a overweight um, in investment grade credit and an overweight in, in, um, in high yield debt. Um, obviously, credit spreads have come in a long way since then. Um, and the question is, does that change the underlying economics? Um, and in some ways, it's a, it's a question about how you're going to go about implementing. So I've never really favoured trying to call tops and bottoms in markets, rather preferring to, to step in, progressively step in and progressively step out of markets as opportunities wax and wane. Uh, so I still think there's very much a case for progressively increasing the credit exposure. Um, obviously, spreads have come in. Um, based on the current environment of, um, of qualified optimism in markets, um, it's reasonable to think that there's a long way to go, meaning some months of uncertainty before we know how this plays out, and yet further to understand the full extent of the economic damage that has occurred. Um, so the recommendation remains, um, just with a word of caution about uh, the implementation of any overweight credit position. Uh, great, Guion. I hope that addresses the question. On. Yeah, yes, no, thank you. But it's obviously stirred up some thoughts in people's minds. So similar question here, which is sort of alluding to that, you know, perhaps cautious optimism that we're seeing coming through the markets with equity markets rebounding. Mm the VIX is down substantially in the last couple of weeks. So the question here is, does Mercer see this as the calm before the storm or maybe in the middle of the storm? Um, and how would we position portfolios in this environment? Well, I mean, obviously we hope that this is, that the, um, that the pandemic is resolving itself and we can return to our, you know, normal, normal activity um, as soon as possible. But e even that, it's reasonable to think the return to normal activity as soon as possible under the most optimistic um, of lockdowns, um, social distancing, in various uh, to be worked through. Um, there's also the threat of um, you know a reinfection or resurgence in the um, in the pandemic. Um, so to think that this is either I wouldn't. Say this is, where, as it were, the eye of the storm or the calm before the storm, merely just a moment in a, uh, what I expect to be some months of volatility in markets. Um, and that's not to say that we're going to see a, a big sell-off um, of the kind that we saw through uh, the end of February and beginning of March. Um, but it does mean that there'll be a lot of up and down. Um, which brings us back to the, uh, the idea of not trying to call tops and bottoms in markets, instead trying to fake positions in based on valuations and expectations um, and to, to time the end of the pandemic as it were. Yeah, that, that's uh, 
a good advice and a good response there, I think, Guion. Um, maybe the last question for today, um, we'll hit up against time and we, we seem to uh, be coming to the end of the questions. Um, maybe, Patty, I might get you to pick this one up, but it's, it's just asking a little bit about unlisted versus unlisted markets and, you know, to the extent that you could get your hands on um, both of both versions at the same time, um, what would we see as being the preferred um, option at the moment? Yeah, I think um, unlisted, sorry, listed to real assets, we're trading at quite significant premiums to um, tangible asset value or the, the underlying valuations prior to the pandemic. They, they've clearly sold off significantly, uh, down by more than 30% on average. Uh, there's been a strong rebound, but they still um, still are valued well below the, the tangible asset value. So you know, you'd be buying listed now, um, albeit you know the, the, the devil's really in the detail as with, with everything here. If you're looking at, a, at an index level, uh, the, the indices have far higher weightings to, to retail and some of the specialist sectors which are directly affected by the pandemic. So probably not the, the assets you really want to be holding uh, in the short term, um, or, albeit you know, the, the values should come back in the, in the long term. Uh, I would caution also with, with REITs so that they have much higher debt levels generally than the unlisted portfolios that, that we manage. Uh, so you know, those, those debt levels will be tripping covenants a lot quicker um, for assets which are have income which is impaired. So it's it's being selective, um, not buying the index, but uh, on a case by case basis, there's probably some good value uh, in, in the REIT sector. Correspondingly, we are starting to see some, some very good value in the unlisted sector as well. Uh, I mentioned earlier, we, we picked up a, a very attractive um, secondary at, at a good discount to NTA from a, a distressed vendor. Um, we do expect some of the, the super funds who are over allocated to illiquid assets and their peers globally uh, to also be offering um, opportunities at attractive pricing um, through this. So, um, yeah, I, I think the, the straight answer, Kylie, is uh, you know, REIT's probably screened for, for cheaper valuations now, but uh, you know, really, you really have to delve into detail, as always, with uh, investing in um, real assets. Great. Thanks, Patty. Well, I think we'll call it to an end. So thank you very much to all our panellists today and for all of our um, audience for joining us. I hope that you find that found that helpful. Certainly, thank you for your active engagement and very good questions. Um, we hope that you'll be able to join us again next week for what will be the last in this series. So just as a reminder, we'll look at uh, capital market implications, um, some of the links with responsible investing and ESG, and again, get a, get a macro update. Um, we certainly welcome feedback on these sessions, so please send it through. Um, you know, be, be great as we end this series to get a sense of whether people find these sessions helpful um, and whether we can re revise them in or revive them in, in, into the future. Um, otherwise, thank you very much. Uh, stay safe and well. Goodbye.